I feel like I'm reading a eulogy. <laughs> G'day guys, Cam Wild Wild Touring. Welcome to another episode. After 150,000 Ks and six and a half years of owning the D-Max, it's up for sale. I've just finished its last couple of trips and as always, it's performed uh, perfectly. So if you're new to the channel uh, and you don't already know, the D-Max has been with me for near on seven years and I'm selling it to upgrade to a 300 series Land Cruiser, which I've got on order and uh, I've just had an email from Toyota to say it's being assembled as we speak and it'll be here in the next couple of weeks. So this video is a little bit of a review of uh, the D-Max after seven years of ownership. It's going to be fairly specific to, to dual cab utes if that's something that you're in the market to look at. There's a couple, of, um, a couple of things that I've learned over the years that I can share with you that might help you decide if that's the right kind of vehicle for you. And the rest of the video is going to be a little bit of a, a chat about what modifications worked, more generic, what sort of mods worked for touring and, and camping and full driving and caravanning. And also a little bit of an insight into what I'm going to be doing with a 300 series build. So hopefully there's something that you'll get out of this, hopefully something of interest. Let's crack on and get into it. So this is a 2016 model. I bought it in early 2017. I paid $40,000 for it. It's the first new car I've ever owned. Um, and I think that was really good value and I still think it represents really good value. It's the longest I have ever owned a car by a long shot. As some of you guys that are regular viewers would know, I've had quite a few cars previous to this YouTube channel, some are in the realm of, of 20 to 30 odd um, of every make and model. So I don't have any sort of brand bias or anything like that. Although I probably am a little bit biased towards the D-Max because I've had such a good run from it. So the reason I bought this new in 2017, but I bought a 2016 model was because 2012 to 2016, uh, versions had, had really proven themselves to be reliable, rugged, simple, no frills, all those kinds of things that I wanted for full driving. Um, not too many electronics, not too much to go wrong. Having said that, this is still the only vehicle I've ever owned that I've uh, had issues with that were so severe that I wasn't able to drive it home under its own steam. We'd been full driving, uh, we were camped for the evening, and in the morning when I went to start the car to drive home, car wouldn't turn over, car wouldn't start. It was towed to my nearest dealer and they um, plugged their computers into it and, and basically told me that it was an immobilizer issue. It was like a, a software issue. The immobilizer unit had to be reflashed, both keys had to be reflashed and, um, and that was it. So that was covered by warranty, a uh, huge inconvenience. And unfortunately, this is the reality of modern cars as well. They are overcomplicated now common issues with this model specifically 2012 to 2016 were all the same essentially you may have heard and i've experienced it myself the the inside skirt or inside guards inside the bonnet um, crack they subject to metal fatigue they can tear also the evaporator core for the aircon which again happened to me um, cracked as well again metal fatigue 
it's all about vibrations and, and things bouncing around inside that engine bay and the consensus at the moment is that it's probably due to the factory body mounts at the front of the car. The Isuzu factory body mounts are probably a little bit soft and a little bit small. So what a lot of people are doing and what I did myself was exchange them for stiffer, uh, wider Holden Colorado mounts. They bolt up the same way, they're the same size, they're just a bit, bit wider and a bit firmer. So they're really the main issues that are specific to the D-Max. Other than those issues, I think they make a really good car. I've certainly pushed mine to its limits. It's been loaded up to its GVM or its increased GVM. Uh, it's been loaded to GCM and it's been towing a you know a three ton plus caravan with four people on board, canopy full of gear, legally and safely on every crappy road that we can find. <laughs> so to summarize, 2012 to 2016 Isuzu D-Max with the automatic transmission, if you could find the lowest kilometer uh, for me personally, I'd be looking for the one closest to stock form that hasn't done too much off-road work, doesn't have too many modifications. I think if you could find one that fit your, your budget with low caves, they're a really good buy. Anyway, that's all specific to the D-Max. Moving on, talking about modifications for touring, camping, caravanning, stuff that's worked for us and stuff that um, we've learnt along the way that I can share with you. You probably heard me bang on a lot about all vehicles being compromises. And I truly do believe that. The, the dual cab ute is the ultimate compromise of all cars. It's a vehicle that's expected to be able to, you can drive it into the city and park it in a, in a, in a busy car park. It'll hold highway speeds with four people on board. It's supposed to be able to tow three and a half ton. Uh, you can, on the weekend, you can take it down to the beach loaded full of camping gear and bust through um, loose sand along the beach. It's at home on a, on a, for a tradesperson on a job site with tools loaded in the back. And they are capable of doing all of those things, but I think they need the right supporting modifications. And you have to have realistic expectations. I hear a lot of people um, on you know, Facebook forums and stuff like that, they, buy a, they go out and buy a brand new $150,000 Land Cruiser and they're surprised that they need to put suspension or airbags or make some sort of um, changes or modifications to it to be able to hitch a, two, a three and a half ton caravan with it and safely drive at highway speeds on <laughs> unsealed roads. Again, they're capable of doing that, but you need the right supporting modifications to do it. It's not gonna be able to do all of those things that you want it to do with three and a half ton hitched on the back, but then also handle like a sports car on the road with no weight in the back of it. It's just not possible. So on that note, I've definitely made a lot of modifications to this vehicle to be able to do all the things that I wanted to be able to do with it, which is, comfortably live out the back of it, um, have all the camping gear, everything have a spot, um, all of that, plus still put four people in the car, tow our three ton caravan loaded to GVM and GCM, and then be able to pull it all up safely and for the weights to be legal. So there were, yeah, there were quite a few modifications that needed to be done to be, to be able to do all of that. We've learnt a lot about what works and what doesn't work. We've, there's been a few lessons to be learnt along the way. Not everything was right the first time, but those lessons that we've learned, we're going to put into practice with the 300 series cruiser when it arrives. We're picking the stuff that we know works. Um, so in some ways, it's, the 300 series will probably be a fairly simple build. Um, there's, it's not going to be a, a clickbaity game changer and none of that sort of crap. Um, it's just going to be stuff, good quality gear that works. And unfortunately, with that, I think the old saying that buy once, cry once, as much as I hate to admit it, I think it rings true. And we've certainly experienced that with this car. If you've been watching for a while, you'd have noticed that this car's really had two distinct builds. The first build, um, there was bar work all over it. Obviously, I wasn't very weight focused. I was more budget focused. So we had a cheap checker plate, Chinese aluminium canopy on the back, uh, homemade drawers and stuff like that. And look, it, it worked really well. And if, if it was between doing that and then having the funds left over to travel Australia, or bombing it out with all the best gear but then having no money left to actually travel with the thing, then I would do it all the same way again. I'd, I'd run a cheaper setup to have money left over to travel. But what happened was running that cheaper gear, the cheaper bar work, the cheaper um, canopy, you know, within two years, things were cracking and tearing and falling apart. The canopy was full of dust and full of water. Um, yeah, the bull bar literally had a hole torn out of it from, from metal fatigue. So although it was expensive to kit it out with, you know, nice flash gear, it was also expensive having to do it twice within two years. So I probably learnt my lesson there. 
on that note, the, the canopy from Thunderfab is fantastic. It keeps everything secure and dry. There's central locking. It looks really good. Everything's modular. Everything has its place. Um, it just, I don't know, it was, a, it was a pleasure to camp out of. It's still the best canopy I've ever seen um, in Australia. So with the new canopy build, the focus shifted away from uh, budget and it shifted towards reliability, uh, longevity, and there was a massive focus on weight and specifically weight reduction. And the reason for that was that uh, my priorities were changing. When, when, when I first bought this, this vehicle back in 2017, Tiff and I didn't have any kids and we honestly never had any sort of expectations of towing anything bigger than a camper trailer. We never thought we'd be caravan people. Um, I'm still not sure I'm a caravan person, but uh, no, nah, it's not true. I love having a van. But a mid-size dual cab four-wheel drive is probably not the best option to tow a full-size caravan. Um, but we had to try and make that work because we already had the car. Uh, we'd spent more than we could afford on a caravan. I certainly couldn't afford to buy another car at the time. So the focus was on making this work, which meant shifting a lot of weight off the car and also choosing a caravan that was as light as possible, which I think we did a pretty good job a pretty good job of. The caravan's got a tear weight of um, 2.4 tonne. For a full-size off-road family caravan, that's, that's fairly light. But to do that legally and safely, I had to put a GVM upgrade on this car. And that's probably gonna be true for most of you that wanna uh, kit your car out with a touring type build, have your kids on board and also tow a, a full-size van. You're almost always gonna have to put a GVM upgrade on your car. So back in 2017, I went to Pedders. Um, I identified that pretty early on and I put a, a Pedders GVM upgrade on the car. And it's a funny thing to talk about because I never really think about it. It just, it just uh, which is probably a good thing, a testament to the, to the kit, but it just does what it does. It just works well. The car's level, it's sprung correctly. There's no airbags or weight distribution bars for the van or anything. Um, it sits level, it handles uh, well unloaded, it handles well loaded, it handles well on and off road. Um, yeah, so again, you're probably gonna see that um, this, what I've learned from that going forwards with the 300 series, uh, Petters has worked really well for me, so I'll definitely be going back to them with the, with the Cruiser. What I did notice though, was after we got rid of the small uh, MDC Forbes caravan and we got the bigger size van, you know, my weights were increasing and the car's getting closer to that GCM limit. And the brakes, with drum brakes on the back of, the, of, of these utes, they don't pull up great. So that was something that I wanted to look at. So back to Petters again, I did the uh, drum to disc conversion. That made a huge difference. I can distinctly remember the first time, actually the, driving the car away from Petters and, and putting the anchors on it a set of lights or something like that. And also the first time that I hitched the van on the back made a huge difference. Um, so I did the drum to disc conversion on the back. I also changed the front rotors over to a Petters slotted rotor. Um, and I'm also using their Kevlar ceramic pads. So it got a brake upgrade front and rear, and I can say that made a huge difference. I'm definitely noticing that more people are aware of GVMs, GVM upgrades, um, looking at the, the plates on the caravans to, to work out what the payload actually is. When you look at what the tear is and what the ATM is and working out the payload, there's definitely more education and more awareness around this, which is really good. And I think the next step of that, where people need to start to look is, I'm bolting all this crap onto my car. I'm towing a massive van. I've got my weights all legal now, but the factory brakes that were meant to pull up a two ton car are now trying to pull up a, a six or a seven ton combined um, car and caravan. Yes, there's trailer brakes and stuff on your, on your caravan, but certainly your car brakes are working harder than ever before as well. So um, that made a massive difference for me, the brake upgrade, and that's something that I will do. I'm not gonna wait this time. That's something that I'll do fairly early on with the 300 series. Um, definitely gonna go back to Petters and look at their brake upgrade options as well. Other supporting mods that I fitted pretty early on to be able to lug all this weight around was a, a tune. So I took it to a tuner in 2017 and I got a piggyback ECU fitted. A lot of people get reflashes or, or get the factory computer remapped. Um, I ended up getting like a piggyback ECU, so it's a separate computer that, yeah, piggybacks if you like, the factory one. I think there's other benefits for doing that, but the main benefit for me was I got selectable tunes. So I was quite aware of um, not wanting to push the car too hard. So I liked the option of having a selectable tune for towing, which was a leaner, safer AFR, air to fuel ratio. And, uh, and then I also had the option for just having all out power when I wasn't towing anything and I, I was full driving in the sand dunes or along the beach or, or 
driving, even just commuting day to day um, to work on the road or whatever. So that was really beneficial. I've had no dramas with that. I probably won't do that again with a 300 series. The D-Max really did suffer from being quite sluggish, um, quite underpowered. The 300 series makes pretty respectable power from factory, um, so I probably won't push that any harder. But the other thing that I noticed pretty early on was I was monitoring my transmission temps and engine temps and everything else with like a scan gauge type tool. It was an ultra gauge, was the actual brand. And I noticed the transmission temps, even on uh, pretty mild days like today, with just the camper trailer on the back, the transmission temps were sort of getting to, you know, the edge of what's reasonable. And I knew that when I'm up north on 45 degree days, towing for eight hours with a big van on the back, that I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. So I fitted a transmission cooler, and that definitely brought those temperatures down to a to something that I was more comfortable with. On that topic, I'm just gonna quickly have a chat about insurance claims and warranty claims with aftermarket modifications on your vehicle. I've had a few comments on videos before where people have said, Cam, because you've got a GVM upgrade or because you've tuned your car, you no longer have any warranty. Are you worried about that? Um, that's not true. There's a lot of misinformation there. A small amount of truth, but that blanket statement is, is just not fair or correct. I've had successful warranty and insurance claims with all the modifications on my car. As long as things are legal, they're ADR approved, the things that need to be engineered and mod plated are done. Um, and all of that comes from using reputable uh, workshops and, and fitting reputable gear, then you'll have no dramas. Where the small amount of truth comes from is if you've got an aftermarket modification that causes a specific issue and then you've put in a warranty claim, uh, for that issue that was caused by your aftermarket modification, then yes, they will probably knock back uh, your claim. They probably won't pay out on it. And an example of that is uh, it might be something like your car's tuned, it's running really high boost and um, a really rich AFR, and you have a failed injector. Your modifications may have, um, may have caused that or led to that failure. So yeah, Isuzu will probably knock you back. But just because your car's tuned, doesn't mean that if you've got crappy paint and it needs a repaint or your dash cracks um, or something else unrelated to that modification fails, it doesn't mean that Isuzu wouldn't pay out on, on, on your claim. So yeah, your modifications have, your dealer when you go in for a claim has to be able to prove that the modification that you fit aftermarket specifically caused that issue. And I think that's where the confusion's coming in. With the tune and all the mods on my car, I've obviously changed the aerodynamics, I've got bigger wheels, um, I've got a lot more weight. I was still getting 11 litres per 100 k's just sort of driving around um, without the van on the back, around town uh, and all, all the rest of that. And I was getting around 18 to 20 litres towing the three tonne van with the family on board and several hundred litres of water and all that good gear. So I think that was pretty good economy i was quite happy with that i don't expect to get economy that good in the 300 series i think it's a bigger heavier car it's a bigger motor i'll be using more fuel than that um but i'll report on that when i know and and let you guys know so like i said before i've learned a lot through every build i've ever done uh, and this one probably more so because i've owned it for longer there's things that worked, things that didn't work. Going forwards with the Land Cruiser build, I'm gonna stick with brands um, and gear that I know works. There will be a few new products and a few new brands um, that I'm interested in that I'll, that I'll look at fitting their gear to the car. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you all about them as we fit it to the car in a few weeks time, hopefully, or maybe a couple of months time. But yeah, it's gonna be, the focus is gonna be a, a really simple, functional um, build. It's, there's no, like I said, no crazy game changer, clickbaity shit. Um, it's just going to be something that's suitable for uh, where we are right now uh, with, with what we want to be able to do with the car. And on that note, lots of people are saying you're going to miss having the canopy. Um, and they're right. I am absolutely going to miss having the canopy on the back. But priorities have changed. We've got a bigger caravan. We've got two kids. The kids are getting bigger. We've got a 12-month lap of Australia planned um, that's you know coming up fairly quick now where we're going to be doing 30, 40,000 Ks in a car. The D-Max by then is going to be 10 years old. Um, and we just want something that's more comfortable. It's quieter. There's more space for the kids. There's room in the boot for the dog. Um, we've got a little bit more flexibility with the weight carrying capacity. Um, all of those sort of reasons. So yeah, the priorities have shifted and that's why we're looking at, 
at a different car. So as much as I am gonna miss living out the back of this canopy, you know, on boys trips and stuff like that, this worked really well. Um, I'm equally excited about getting the cruiser and fitting that out for, you know, the next sort of stage in our life and, and what our priorities are now. So Mark, the new owner of the D-Max is, is picking it up today. And I've got really mixed feelings about that. Like I said, I'm excited to get the new car, but I'm also, um, yeah, it's really sad to see this one go. It's been a really, I don't know, it's just been a, a reliable car. There's a lot of memories tied up in it. It's the only car the kids have ever known. Yeah, I think the whole family is gonna be pretty, uh, pretty gutted to see it drive away, to be honest with you. I absolutely had to sell it um, to be able to fund the cruiser you know, this is going some of the way towards that. Uh, I never even got a chance to advertise this. Mark uh, watches the channel and he started messaging me back in April, I think, saying, Cam, you know, you've just ordered this cruiser. What are you doing with your D-Max? And I probably um, strung him along for a little bit. I'm sorry, Mark, because I wasn't 100% sure uh, with the timing when the cruiser was coming and I didn't want to be without a car. And I've also, um, you know, of course I've had thoughts about can I afford to keep this and can I have one full drive car and one tow car, but that's just not a reality for me. So it's gotta go. But the funny thing about me selling my car to someone who watches the channel is there's no hiding about where it's been or how it's been driven um, or what I've been doing with it. I obviously can't write an ad that says one lady owner never been off road. I'm probably not gonna get away with that. I've actually had people comment on videos before because you know I'm quite brutally honest about my experience with things. Sometimes to my own detriment, I'm sure. I've, I've got myself in a little bit of trouble being too honest about some things. But I've had comments from people saying, Cam, why are you telling people that you've cracked the body or that you've done this or done that? You, you're never gonna be able to sell this car when the time comes. And th that never even occurs to me at the time. I, I, I would never be concerned about telling the telling my story or my experience of something because I'm worried about selling something in the future. That just doesn't, that doesn't compute for me. Um, and uh, it hasn't seemed to have an impact on selling this vehicle. And I think that's because people are aware that, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty hard on my gear and I sort of push it to the limit, but I also really look after my stuff. It's gotta be safe and reliable for me to put my family in it and, and drive out to remote, remote places or drive at speed with a lot of weight on the back. So. Um, other than just like the normal regular scheduled servicing, a heap of money, time and effort goes into preventative maintenance on this car. Um, that's one thing that I would never skimp on. I look after my stuff and I think that's reflected by the condition that the car's in given where it's been. Um, I, I'll show you some footage from inside the thing. It's pretty crazy how, um, how it's scrubbed up actually. It's one of those things, whenever you're about to, to sell something and you've just got your mind into that gear that you're ready to let it go and then you give it like the best birthday it's ever had it gets the best clean and, and you're like shit why am i selling this thing this thing's wicked and i absolutely feel that right now about the d-max <laughs> but it's got to go the cruise is on its way anyway i hope you got something out of that um, or at least enjoyed a little walk down memory lane with me um yeah the the trip up to darwin and back and with the family and the van in tow and the trip out to the Kennedy Rangers with the boys were the last two trips this car's ever been on. Um, Mark's picking it up today, so by the time you're watching it, I no longer own this vehicle. I am hopefully, from the time recording this, about six weeks away from picking up the Cruiser. I got my email from Toyota saying it's on the assembly line. Um, they, I think it only takes two weeks to build those cars, which is pretty mental. And then it's on a ship uh, to Fremantle Port. And from there, there's a, there's a couple of things being done pre-registration, um, and then we'll start the build. So hopefully it doesn't take too long. Uh, I'm really excited and I just wanna get started on it. Anyway, cheers guys, thank you for watching. And the next car you see me in is gonna be the new one. Cheers.